Hello everyone. Welcome to Third Lane. This is Orku Priya, your host for the podcast. 2021 is a very special year. Among other things, it marks three significant anniversaries. The 50th anniversary of the Bangladesh Liberation War, the 100th birth anniversary of Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, and the century since the foundation of Dhaka University. This podcast is a part of a special issue celebrating the 50th anniversary of this momentous war. Today, we will be hosting a conversation on the historical and geopolitical context of the Bangladesh war. And for that, we offer a warm welcome to Dr. Iftikhar Ahmed Choudhury. He has most graciously agreed to give us his take on this topic. Dr. Iftikhar Ahmed Choudhury is former foreign minister of Bangladesh. He had been ambassador and permanent representative to the United Nations in New York and Geneva. Between 2009 and 2020, Dr. Choudhury was principal research fellow at the Institute of South Asian Studies, National University of Singapore. He has authored several books and articles on international relations and geopolitics. He is currently senior group advisor of Main Herd International in Singapore. Hello, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, first of all, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. I just wanted to say that I'm very glad to be here. You are absolutely right. This is a very auspicious year for us. Uh, the centenary of the birth of Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, the father of the nation. And it is also the 50th year uh, since we attained independence from his, his leadership. Uh, at the same time, um, I should be derelict of my responsibilities were I to begin without thanking India and Indians for the tremendous support that your forebears actually, uh, or Capriya, uh, have rendered us uh, through our struggle, uh, the unstinted support for which we shall be ever in your debt. So with these words, I'm, I'm ready to talk to, uh, uh, respond to the questions you'll ask me, but, but I broadly get the sense that uh, I would be expected to talk about how, uh, 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 how the Bangladesh independence movement began, how the Indian support came about, uh, uh, what motivated the parties to behave in the way they did, what was the role of the principal major players on the uh, international scene at that point in time, which is the United States, Soviet Union, China, apart from India, of course. And thereafter, with a few brief remarks of where do we go from here in terms of bilateral relations. Okay, I get the picture, so I'm ready. Okay, so moving to our very first question, uh, as we know, sir, the policy of India's uh, Didin Prime Minister, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, towards the growing political agitation in East Pakistan uh, at that time, 1971, and the explicit demands of autonomy was of utmost circumspection. And also before the war, uh, many people in East Pakistan were apprehensive of Indian imperialism. So uh, why did India go for a war against Pakistan in 1971, instead of considering the Bangladesh liberation issue an internal problem of Pakistan. Do you really think that it was a rational decision uh, for a country like India at that time? Well, as you, uh, thank you, Arkapriya, as you yourself have said uh, that uh, Mrs. Gandhi was extremely circumspect. She was very cautious in, in framing the policies at that time. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the circumspection actually came from several factors. Number one, uh, she wasn't, uh, no one was sure as to what will happen in, in terms of the uh, negotiations that were taking place just before the military crackdown began in Pakistan. And uh, she was not in a position to show her flag, which was very supportive very supportive of, of, uh, of, uh, of the Bangladesh cause. But at that point in time, uh, she had uh, 
considered that if uh, support was uh, formally announced in any form of way, it would probably impede the cause because that would just uh, 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 underscore the Pakistani position that uh, it, it was India which was behind, uh, behind the uh, uh, movement itself. Uh, and also she was not very sure uh, what the ultimate solution to the problem will be. Uh, thereafter, a second cause for circumspection was uh, if she were to support what was obviously going to be a secessionist movement, whether it would uh, uh, obtain the approval of the international community. Remember those days, secession was a very, very rare thing. Biafra had just happened and it failed. Uh, so uh, she was absolutely certain that it's going to be have to, it's going to be have, uh, have to be an uphill struggle to get the international community to support her on this. And uh, thirdly, I remember the, India is a, is a very large country, a disparate country of many nationalities, states, etc. And if she were to support a secessionist movement uh, at its doorstep, I mean, it could spell problems and issues for the union of India itself in due course. I, uh, so, and uh, uh, finally, yes, I mean, the fact that uh, whether uh, uh, she can pull it through, whether India was, uh, uh, was in terms of capabilities, both financial and military, able to pull off uh, a policy that should frame in this regard, a policy of support. Uh, she had to provide a lot of thought. If India thought of uh, intervening, why limit it, this intervention just to East Pakistan? Why did India desist from engaging in a major attack in the Western Front on Pakistan and try to seize the Pakistan-held Kashmir? Of course, this is, this is a political strategic decision, uh, very appropriate though, because uh, if she, uh, she was able to pull off what she uh, wanted, uh, that was enough. Now, uh, you see, uh, the principal reason for the intervention, remember, in the first case was to create, and that was her instructions to General Manekshaw in the early stages, to, to create a gateway for the refugees to go back. All right. Mm -hmm. So whatever be the, you see, the Indian uh, um, sort of role came in two phases. You see, the first phase was uh, uh, she was, uh, as we discussed, she was very circumspect. Uh, and yet, behind the circumspection, there was a second possibility of an intervention, you see, actual intervention. And she had uh, Manikshaw readied for that. Hmm. He was, well, he was uh, broadly told that uh, it would be necessary to open that window for the refugees to go back. And, if it, uh, and for that, he wouldn't have too much time, perhaps three to four weeks before there would be a global um, uh, 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 intervention. The ideal thing would have been to limit it to the territory now comprising Bangladesh, which is East Pakistan at that point in time. Now to touch Pakistan, itself, I mean, the, the Western, this thing, uh, there were two, four reasons. One is, this, this is going to be a very broad war, war with Pakistan, with uncertain results. You see, uh, now while sort of handling the issue, uh, uh, this thing, you don't want to lose parts of uh, India itself because Pakistan was militarily quite strong, militarily. And also strategically, remember that, uh, uh, that if there was to be a war with Pakistan, and this was, one of probably Pakistani reasoning also to go to war in December, because Pakistan would have wanted uh, normally uh, a, a, an end to uh, the Mukti Bahini activities within Bangladesh and Indian support to it. Best way to achieve it to, is to get a ceasefire. And you can get a ceasefire by going into a war. So you see, the problem is, I mean, it could have been an understandable Pakistani strategy that was so to go into a war immediately get a ceasefire and stop in the Indian intervention for all times, you see, and Bangladesh wouldn't have happened. So, I mean, fortuitously, everything went in favor of how Mrs. Indira Gandhi took those decisions. By the way, as a footnote, I want to say that uh, I did have, uh, 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 I was uh, also uh, in my younger uh, days as a, a civil servant, I belonged to what was then called the Pakistan Civil Service and thereafter the CSP and thereafter uh, uh, transferred to Bangladesh. I was private secretary to General uh, M. Usmani, who was commander-in-chief of the Liberation War. So uh, 
I was a bit au courant with uh, what had happened then. And I had the opportunity of an interview with Mrs. Gandhi later on when I was writing up my thesis, uh, 30th of April, 78, I think. I, I met her in Kelvington Street, where she lived at that point in time. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, I was able to discern in many ways, of course, it was a few years after the events, but able to discern what, uh, what uh, you know, motivated her. So, so that was really, really insightful. Uh, the long history of communal tension we have in the Bengal politics uh, from 1905 partition, Bongo Bongo. And then again, we have that Great Calcutta killing at 1946 and the Noakali riot as a result. So how did Bengal politics evolve in terms of Hindu-Muslim relationship? Uh, uh, you see, pre-British Bengal, whatever there was Bengal, pre-British, there were no communal tensions between Hindus and Muslims in, 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 in Bengal at that point in time. Um, I mean, even, even in our little uh, literary, this thing, uh, okay, uh, there, there is no record of, of that kind of tensions between the, the Muslims of Eastern Bengal, because that's where the conversions first took place, and the Western uh, Bengal, which was more integrated with Indian, broad, broader Indian, Indian politics. When the British came, they did several uh, things, several policies. One was the permanent settlement of Lord Cornwallis in 1973, or in 1773. Now, you see, what a permanent settlement did, as you perhaps know, is it fixed the revenue to be collected by the state, which is by the British, in perpetuity from the zamindars. Uh, and the zamindars, in turn, collected rent from the riot. Uh, but the rent was not fixed. So zamindars tried to exploit as much as possible and obviously wanted to collect as much as possible because the British collection was very efficient. The collectors and deputy magistrates, deputy commissioners did that. Now, you see, in the meantime, in the feudal, uh, feudal hierarchy, a change was occurring because the Muslim, uh, uh, originally the zamindars were Muslims, you know, the Noabi zamindars. But because the, the, uh, the revenue was very high and it was very efficiently collected, uh, they were not able to collect sufficient uh, uh, rent. Uh, they were alienated from their lands and all that, which passed on to a burgeoning, a growing class of people who were merchants, largely Hindu merchants, and those who had worked for them in the zamindaris, uh, you know, they're little bureaucrats. Now, among them, the, uh, the merchants were the commercial classes who act, were actually, uh, you know, absentee landlords because they lived in Calcutta. They liked to live in Calcutta. As a result, what had happened was there was a sense of exploitation felt by the peasantry, which was largely Muslims. So that was not very conducive to intercommunal relationship. And also because uh, the British very effectively sealed off the top of the... Uh, feudalism because there was nothing above the collector and the district magistrate. Everything was below them. So that was permanent settlement was one. The second cause would be, say, the, uh, the change of the, uh, the, the official language from, from uh, a Persian to English, you see, which meant that the top Muslim uh, um, hierarchy in, in Bengal, who were largely Persian uh, educated, uh, who were called the ashram. You see, the, the Muslims were, had two broad categories. Upper classes were called Ashraf and the lower classes Atraf. So the Ashraf Muslims uh, got uh, removed from positions of authority in governance, in government, etc. At the same time, remember, because of, the, uh, because of the permanent settlement was having a negative impact on the Atraf. So there was an alliance between the Ashraf and the Atraf Muslims. You see, it's almost like a class alliance, which led to three broad movements in Bengal among the Muslims. One was Faraisi movement, which was roughly between 1810 to 1831. There was the Indigo riots, 1859-60, I think, and the Pabna Red Revolt, 1873. You see, some Hindus were also involved, but largely these were Muslim-driven driven movements. So, uh, uh, so these movements also 
gave a sense of uh, identity, almost a tribal identity as we call it now, to the Muslims. You see, uh, this was actually accentuated by two developments within the broad Hindu community. One was a revitalization of the Hindu faith as well, because by 1875, I think Bombay, uh, uh, the, the, what was it called? The Arya Samaj was, was uh, I think, established. So it was mirrored by the, by the uh, Farisi movement in some ways. The Farisi movement had two aspects. One was uh, uh, Siyasi, which is political. The other was Dini, which was religious, but it was political, which was more irrelevant. You see the Siyasi. And the, and the second factor was the growth of the Bhadralok. And the Bhadralok in Bengal. Now, who were the Bhadraloks? I mean, they had a, you see, a, a, you all would be familiar with it, but it's less known in, in our parts of the country in that sense. Uh, it, it was not, uh, according to Broomfield, it was not a Marxian class because they're not mm -hmm. related to processes of production. It was a Weberian status quo. They were known by the way the uh, school, the, uh, the way the, uh, the, the uh, offices they went to, the clubs they frequented, uh, the ideas. I mean, uh, uh, in many ways, um, Almost like a, not like, a, like a, okay, Brahma Shamaj would be a Protestant movement, so to say, but the rest of, uh, was, a, was a sort of a bourgeoisization of, of, of uh, the communities in Calcutta. Now, the Bhadralok uh, did not actually include too many Muslims. Uh, in fact, there was a list uh, uh, called Shaita Shadda which had named, I think, 102 Bengali Bhadralops, of which there was only one who was a Muslim, mm. uh, Mir, uh, Musharraf Hussain, the author of uh, Bishat Shindu. You see? So, now some of these Bhadralops, you see, the Bhadralops also began uh, what is known as the, uh, uh, the, Renaissance, the Bengal Renaissance. Now, people like uh, Shushoban Sharkar call, compare the Bengal Renaissance to the European Italian Renaissance. Actually, it was more like the English Renaissance because it was literary. It was people like you know, uh, you know uh, Henry David Dorosio, the Tagores, uh, Michael Madhusudan Dotto, but also people like Bongkim Chandra and all that. You see, now for example, the Anand Mott, it mm. crea created a reaction, as you can understand, among the Muslims because they were uh, uh, described as intruders. So those those things were taking place. So that sort of sharpened the differences somewhat, and finally came the 1905 the Bongo Bongo, the, the division of Bengal. And the division of Bengal was a very strange thing to do, but the stated reason given by Lord Curzon and, uh, and uh, uh, Risley and others who were, uh, was that it, it, uh, it would lead to a reinvigoration of Assam and relief of Bengal, because Bengal was getting too large. At the same time, by hiving off, hiving off East Bengal and adding it to Assam, you were creating another Muslim majority province, which the Muslims uh, then liked. You see, it was explained to them. I and mean, the British were very careful in explaining to them as well. They look, chaps, this is to your benefit. Okay. But then came a Bhadralok reaction to this Bongo Bongo. You see, uh, uh, the Andolan that took place, as a result of which it had to be rescinded, I think around 1911 or so, it was rescinded. But that rescindment of the, uh, of the uh, partition of Bengal turned the anger of some of these Muslims, so at the hurt or whatever from the Muslims, not so much at the British, but at the, at the Bhadralok community, at the, uh, uh, which is largely Hindus, you see? So all these developments sharpened these division. At the same time, since it's a very broad question that you asked, what was also happening in Bengal is that uh, it, it was a Muslim majority. By that time, it had become Muslim majority the entire uh, province. But this majority was not politically very active. Uh, they used to, their leaders used to, uh, uh, used to indulge in Darbari politics. You know, the big knobs and all that sort of thing would relate to the governor or governor general and, and, and claim to represent the, the Muslim community. Here an important thing happened, which is very significant for the future of Bengal, India, Bangladesh, etc. The Bengali Muslims also discovered that their, their uh, interest as a 
Bengali Muslim community was different from the interests of the Northern Indian Muslims. You see, how, how was it? Because here, Bengal was a Muslim majority province. Now, in 1960, there was a pact between the Congress and the Muslim League. You see, Muslim League also was created after the partition of Bengal in Dhaka because as a, uh, as a mark of uh, loyalty to the British, anyway, as was Congress for that matter. So Muslim League and Congress in 1916 agreed uh, uh, to a pact, which is called the Lucknow Pact, 1916, whereby uh, they decided, they agreed to give weightage to minorities. So Muslims would benefit in provinces when they were a minority, but in Bengal, where there were 52.4% uh, or something, they were getting 40% of the seats. That's when the Muslims of Bengal realized that, no, that is not to our advantage. At the same time, the 1935 Act uh, uh, also broadened the electoral uh, base, right? So all the premiers of Bengal who were elected after, who came after 1935, the three of them, all three are Muslims. You see, uh, there was uh, A.K. Fazlul Haq, uh, to start with, who was called Shere Bangla, then, uh, uh, then uh, Sir Khaja Nazimuddin, and then Hussein Shahid Sarwar, who later became Prime, Premier, Prime Minister of Pakistan as well. But uh, they were not necessarily exercising that kind of political power. So the struggle of the, of the Bengali Muslims has always been the translation of the demographic majority to political power. A, a, a challenge with even the Pakistan format in East Pakistan, there were a majority of in Pakistan, but their great struggle was translating their majority into political power. So, so that's it. Uh, a little bit on, on the detail of this thing. Fasil Haq initially, uh, it's very important for the for the for the future of this thing, initially had his own party in 1929 called the Krishok Raja Party. Okay, now Krishak Praja Party uh, did not get a majority, but under 30, uh, in the 30, uh, 37 election, 30, uh, elections, enough to form government because he fought with the Muslim League. So he turned to the Congress for support and the Congress did not give him support at that point in time. So he turned back to the Muslim League and joined the Muslim League himself. So the Muslims again in Bengal got united in 1937 Fazlul Haq joined the Muslim League. Later, uh, later, he, in fact, it was he who moved uh, the Lahore resolution, Lahore, which Lahore, 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 Lahore. resolution in, in Lahore. But the, uh, Mr. Jinnah at one point in 1943 or so wanted him to leave the Defense <laughs> Council and he didn't. Uh, so he fell out with the Muslim League. And the Muslim League ministers then, uh, uh, Hussain Shahid Sarwardi and uh, and uh, uh, Sir Nazimuddin left the cabinet. Then Fazlak turned to, uh, to uh, Shama Prashad Mukherjee, and they created actually a, a, a coalition, the Hakshama mm -hmm. Ministry. But Shama Prashad Mukherjee also left in 1943 on the Bengal food. Uh, uh, this thing. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, his advice was not heeded according to him. So Fazlak was left with the minority and, uh, and uh, the governor uh, wanted him to leave naturally sacked him. So the government went to the Muslim League. Muslim League and then uh, first Nazimuddin, then Sarwadi. So it fell in line with the broad Muslim League politics of India. The Bengal government fell in love with, uh, aligned with Bengal uh, Muslim League politics of India. In the meanwhile, there's another footnote to this. Sarwadi at one point in time wanted a united Bengal. And with some support from uh, 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 Sharad uh, Bose and others, you see, and also some Muslim leaders, they in fact uh, created a document for uh, uh, a draft for uh, a republic, a republic of Bengal, uh, a socialist republic of Bengal. But mind you, republic was a very strong word, which meant they were even going beyond dominion. You see, those days the idea of independence was a dominion. You still had to be British in some way, but here he was but it didn't get anywhere. And anyway, Sarwadi fell in line with, with the Muslim League politics when, uh, when Pakistan happened, uh, East Bengal uh, as a Muslim majority joined, uh, uh, joined uh, Pakistan. At that point in time, Congress also opposed this United Bengal, et cetera. And, and in fact, uh, 
um, Mukherjee said that, you know, there will be two Bengals, no matter whether it's Pakistan or not. So that is, that is how um, uh, uh, sort of uh, Bengal, East Bengal came to Pakistan. But as I said, I'll, I'll try and draw a thesis from it. Now, what is this thesis? Now, the Bengali, East Bengali Muslim of today's Bangladeshi, a large Bangladeshi, of course, it includes Hindus who, who live here. Uh, you see, have two uh, uh, two aspects to their life. This thing, uh, their Bengaliness and their Muslimness. When one is threatened, when they see that their Bengaliness is threatened, they align themselves with the culture, culture. like in, with with say the Calcutta uh, that ethos. When their Muslimness is threatened, they tend to align themselves with non-Indian Muslims. So this is the perennial behavior pattern in a three-body system, as if it were in physics. You see, that's how the Bengali Muslim or rather the Bangladeshi behaves. That's the general pattern of Bangladeshi behavior. Those days, there were only three components in, in, the, uh, in the matrix. Uh, the, uh, the North in, uh, the Hindus, uh, largely uh, Calcutta, uh, uh, Muslims of North India, and the Muslims of East Bengal. Right. When East Bengal became independent as, as Bangladesh, um, it became a part of a greater group. But still, so what happened was this uh, relationship between the three, three elements, uh, that uh, three-body system, three body system, became a multi-body uh, uh, relationship because now they could go to China and they could go to America and, and they could balance their relationship with India, say with China or balance their relationship with Pakistan, with India and that kind of thing, you see? Uh, uh, so it became more complex. So, so that was profound, actually, I must say. So now another uh, neighboring country, China. What was the position of China at uh, 1971? And how did Bangladesh-China relation develop since then? Uh, what was the scenario? OK, uh, very, very, again, very complex. You see, China. Um, in Bengal, traditionally, uh, there was this very strong left tradition. Left tradition meaning trad socialist tradition. I have some like, uh, like you have the, the JLU or something in, in India. Anyway, so also in the political ethos of, of East Pakistan, then East Bengal and then later East Pakistan, there was a strong Chinese uh, appreciation for Mao's struggle, uh, eventually, uh, uh, the, 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 the Red China Republic, etc. In fact, uh, Mr. Sarwardi, you know, the former Premier of Bengal when he was Prime Minister of Pakistan, uh, well, he actually visit, uh, uh, visited uh, China. He invited um, uh, Joe and Lai to to, uh, Bang, uh, to Dhaka. And later on, I remember, you know, I was a little boy then, but uh, Liu Shaoqi was president all came. So there was a very strong connection with East Pakistan as well. Pakistan. Now, China, of course, would have liked a, a united Pakistan for starters, because China, because Pakistan by that time had become a very strong ally of China. You see, those days, uh, if you recall, the only Chinese ally was Albania. So now you had Pakistan, and and uh, in fact, even the air, uh, air links with uh, Pakistan was through Dhaka. And Pakistan was playing a very important role in getting. It was a conduit to America's relationship with, with, China. with, with China. China. See, they were like the mediator. Scene. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, not quite the mediator. Uh, I think that's too strong a word. Facilitator. Facilitator. But that's good enough. I mean, uh, uh, you see, uh, so so it was important for Pakistan. Was important for them. At the same time, the Chinese felt that there was an ideological understanding with the with some elements of the left movement, you see. Uh, so you see, when when the uh, independence struggle was uh, something that we did not discuss, the position of the left. Uh, you see, there was a strong poor Peking left in in, in uh, NAP, uh, NAP. Also, the NAP party, like Molana Bhashani, Ayub Khan, uh, President Ayub actually used Molana Bhashani to build links with China as well because. Uh, Molana Bhashani spent a long uh, several weeks in China for treatment or something, and when you know he met Mao and all that sort of thing, and strengthened the Pakistan-China-China uh, China links. So 
there were two leaders, uh, uh, Toha and Abdul Haq, very strong left wing, uh, extreme left leaders. Now, uh, but, they, but both were pro-Chinese, but they fell out because one supported the, it was a bit like the uh, uh, Charu Bajumdar Oshun Chatterjee, this thing. And, and uh, 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 Toha would be, uh, Abdul Haq would be more like Chatterjee, okay? I mean, the Haq Chatterjee uh, sort of uh, view of things. They are, so they all, did not necessarily support the independence movement in, in that sense, sense, not as a bourgeois, this thing for a, for a separate state, but for they wanted a bigger revolution. So that was another danger. When we talked of why India came in when it did, also because if this the liberation struggle lengthened, you see, there was a danger that it, the, 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 uh, the movement may shift from uh, the leadership of the sort of centrist Awami League to far left, you see, and it can become a, what, what in, in, in socialist or communist jargon is a revolution, you see, because uh, they were already saying that, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, what is that, that uh, countries want independence, nations uh, want liberation, uh, peoples want revolution. So China was very, very careful. In fact, in 1970, uh, after the elections, Bhutto and, uh, and uh, uh, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib, uh, China sent a letter to Pakistan urging Yahya, urging that he settle these differences between uh, uh, Bhutto and Bangabandhu Mujib. Okay. okay. Then in 71, uh, I recall it was 11th of April when Joe and Lai sent another letter to uh, General Yahya, President Yahya, saying that he should stop these atrocities. You see, okay. they were still supporting one Pakistan. You see, but uh, sometimes, you know, strangely enough, Chinese uh, 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 articles and all that would laud the revolutionary struggle of the people of Pakistan. And later on, analysts uh, began to ascribe those kind of language to, to a sort of intellectual support of the, of the movement, of the, of the Bangladesh movement. But the fact remains that China initially uh, did not support the separation of Pakistan, the division of Pakistan, but later on they put out that they did not because they were not opposed to Bangladesh per se, but opposed to singing in a duet as Wang Hua was a Chinese ambassador and you know, said, Wang Hua said, singing in a duet of Soviet social imperialism and Indian expansionism. But eventually, and there are many ironies in this story. You see, the Pakistan ambassador to China those days was a, a gentleman called uh, Haja Kaiser, who was a Bengali. Uh, he, was very, uh, he had a very close rapport with Chow Lai, and he was briefing Chow Lai on behalf of Bangladesh, because he was also very close to Bangabandhu. You see, okay. eventually, he, uh, he became Bangladesh's ambassador to China. China. So it was the same person, you see, who... Uh, and in November, the Pakistanis made one last ditch attempt uh, uh, to get China to militarily intervene because Bhutto went on a visit to China. Bhutto went on a visit to China, and, but during the visit, in the banquets, the Chinese were already talking about, uh, you know, a, a, as they say about uh, national independence and sovereignty, protecting national independence and sovereignty of Pakistan. But they carefully avoided the mention of territorial integrity. Now, uh, you see, uh, you have to parse everything that the Chinese say. Everything is fraught, has a lot of meaning, you see. Mm. So when they leave out something like that, that was in, immediately a signal to Bhutto that, look, they're not going to get Chinese military intervention. And Bhutto uh, came back to China, was very disappointed. Uh, uh, I myself spoke to later on, years later, with to Ambassador Kaiser when he was still alive uh, in his later years, and he sort of uh, apprised me of this uh, Bhutto visit in November, uh, which was very disappointing for Bhutto. But China waited, as China always does, for the appropriate time and established these links uh, gradually. Uh, and uh, also, uh, Bangabandhu himself had visited China in his, in, in, as a young politician, and he was very 
uh, eager at the one point to make sure that everybody supports him because, uh, and the Chinese were important. They had, they had a sizable constituency in, in Bangladesh. So, so they came, came on board eventually. So that time, uh, it was a bipolar world of Cold War days, we know, and uh, with two dominant superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. And before 1971, uh, Soviet Russia was taking a balanced position and was striving for creating a Soviet-sponsored collective security system directed at the containment of China. So from that, what made them to exhibit a clear pro-India tilt in their foreign policy? Um, okay. Um, uh, now, Soviet collective security, okay, was a bit, I mean, my own supervisor, Jeffrey Jukes, was a great Soviet expert, uh, you see, so uh, I learned a bit about the Soviet Union from him. You see, yes, uh, the commitment to collective security included India and Pakistan as well. And they would like nothing more than stability in the subcontinent. In fact, as you will recall, uh, 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 the Soviet Union was instrumental in, in, the, uh, in the Tashkent uh, uh, agreement that formally concluded the, the 1965 war between Pakistan and India. So the Soviet Union uh, uh, would have been happy, happy with a, a normal, uh, one Pakistan state, it would have no problem whatsoever with Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib with the Prime Minister of Pakistan. You see, I don't think. Uh, they, had, they had already uh, assessed the Awami League quite positively. Positively as a, as a uh, uh, non-capitalist path within the framework of, uh, of a united front. In other words, they, they like the centrist Awami League uh, to, uh, to align themselves with a softer uh, pro-Russian uh, uh, left and create a united front. They're a typical Le Leninist paradigm that you create a united front and follow a non-capitalist path. You see, anything left of that would be pro-Chinese. So uh, uh, theoretically, the Russians were quite, would have been quite happy to have uh, Sheikh Mujib as uh, prime minister, and uh, they it took them a bit uh, a bit of a shock when when this thing happened, and they were very upset with with Yahya Khan because it, it, it was a big blow to this concept of collective security and all that. And here I must say, uh, also the Indian diplomacy played a tremendous role. Swaran Singh, for instance. Uh, you see, it's all right for, for us to say now because we, we think that we have done a lot of research and we have found out differences when it did not actually ex exist among the personalities involved, like Swaran Singh and uh, Jagjeevan Ram, for instance, you see. Uh, so there is a general sort of received wisdom that Swaran Singh was the more cautious one. Okay, I mean, Swaran Singh was foreign minister. He understood what, uh, what were the club rules of the international community. Uh, Jagjeevan Ram was a little more gung-ho. I mean, Jagjeevan Ram wanted action, quicker action. I mean, all right, you know, agreement between uh, Pakistan and this thing, uh, and the uh, Bengalis or uh, Army League, but there should be, it should be in accordance with everything that the Army League wants. It is said, it is said, not necessarily it's true, but it's a hindsight that uh, uh, you mentioned Mrs. Gandhi's position. She was never a, either a hawk or a dove. She was, she was a very pra pragmatic person. But this, uh, in statements and remarks, you see a slight shift from the, from the uh, uh, Swaran Singh positions to uh, Jagjeevan Ram eventually. Because in August, okay. Now what was happening then was, uh, in fact, when Swaran Singh went to Soviet Union, which he did, uh, yeah, yeah, in the, all the communiques, they were mentioning uh, East Pakistan and not East Bengal or, see, okay. So the so Soviets were still holding on to the thing and Podgorni had written a letter again, like Joe and Lyle, Podgorni letter uh, in April, as a matter of fact, same month to uh, Yahya Khan seeking an understanding. But two years, with reference to what you said about collective security before that, for two years, there have been some talks going on about an 
uh, an agreement between India and Russia of friendship and, uh, and cooperation. You see, Mrs. Gandhi thought this was the appropriate time to dangle this in front of uh, the Russians, uh, the Soviets. And she did it marvelously, okay. She herself uh, undertook, as you know, a, a very long trip uh, in, in October, November to, to, uh, uh, to uh, Russia. I think she, yeah, Australia, Russia, she went, yes. then also later to Australia, UK, Belgium, Germany, France, and France. the U US. US we will probably go to the US later. Yeah, she went to, and she decided that, okay, I mean, no, I mean, there's going to be military action now after August is the second phase, mm -hmm. and we would need Russian support, you see? So she, uh, in August, the agreement was signed. August, the agreement was signed. And thereafter, what, uh, what uh, was the last straw on the camel's back was when Bhutto went to China in, in November. Uh, uh, Bhutto went to China and, uh, and uh, you know, made those, all those efforts to get Chinese support, etc. And that sort of was, was last while I said for or Russia, and so Russia, uh, in fact, uh, opted to support India totally. The Russian support became extremely significant as the denouement neared, as the end neared, you see, when the fighting was going on, you see. What Russia did, uh, you see, but for Russia, the fighting would not have ended the way. It when everyone called for uh, ceasefire, you know, ceasefire is something like motherhood. I mean, everybody is, supports ceasefire, you see? Now, if there was a ceasefire resolution adopted in, 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 in Security Council 14th, 15th of December, you see, uh, I'm not certain, I've been a, a UN diplomat, I'm not certain Bangladesh should, uh, you know, come to fruition in, in this way. So what the Russians did, was no one actually could suppose, uh, support a ceasefire, uh, could not but support ceasefire because people are dying in wars. The Russians linked the ceasefire to the uh, fruition of the aspirations of, or will of the uh, uh, demand of the uh, East Pakistanis or East Bengalis. So these two were linked. So you have ceasefire, you have to satisfy East, East Bengal demand. In other, by that time, the demand was uh, it was no longer a will, it was a demand, and it was a demand for Bangladesh. So you have to have ceasefire and Bangladesh together, you see? So, so the Russians vetoed that resolution. And once that resolution was vetoed, there was a day left. By that time, the Indian army was hurtling towards Dhaka. The agreements had taken place between the commanders. And for all uh, purposes, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, the Indian army was just trying to reach Dhaka to secure Dhaka and take it away formally from, from the Pakistan army, which was huddled in, in Dhaka at that point in time. So at, just at that moment, Russia uh, vetoed uh, the resolution and Bangladesh came to be. They waited a few weeks, by the way, to, to accord recognition because uh, the Russian recognition came, I think, towards the end of January, around the 24th, if I remember right, 24th January, because those days we all were counted dates. Yes. See. Yes. So 24th January was, you know, a month away from uh, 16th December. But what Pakistan had done, in, you see, Bhutto being, you know, the sort of, uh, he, uh, there is a doctrine in international uh, relations called Holstein doctrine. Holstein doctrine is, say, if I have an enemy and you recognize my enemy, you de-recognize me and I don't recognize you. So all those countries that, was rec that were recognizing uh, Bangladesh, initially the small, like Bulgaria and all that, uh, Pakistan was breaking off diplomatic relations with them. So okay. Russia waited a bit because uh, obviously they didn't want to burn all their boats vis-a-vis uh, -vis Pakistan. So, but then it was perceived, and we all perceived, we were very young diplomats, we were all in civil servants, perceived that Pakistan was using the Holstein doctrine selectively. They didn't use it in the case of uh, Burma. Burma recognized Bangladesh early. Pakistan didn't uh, uh, impose it. I think uh, at worst, in some cases, they called back the ambassadors. So end of January for this and probably other reasons, Russia, for a few, after a few weeks, recognized Pakistan. Uh, so, uh, did it hamper the relationship between uh, Pakistan and Russia after that or now? What is the current uh, relation now, Pakistan and Russia? No, no, I mean, 
okay. Remember, that was 50 years ago. Huh. And as uh, uh, the Greek philosopher Heraclitus said, you never step into the same river twice. So, so things have changed a lot. Yes, but today's relationship between Pakistan and uh, and and, uh, and uh, is that what you're asking, yeah. Pakistan and Russia? Yeah, I, I don't think that is linked to uh, to the role in 1971 yeah. at all. And these are a function of uh, contemporary politics. Okay, so so now we are going to on the other side of the Iron Curtain, uh, Richard Nixon, uh, the U.S. president. His proposal was at the time that the emerging structure of peace. So was that a main reason for not? intervening in this war. I mean, it was uh, quite obvious. And also, I believe Iaia Khan or General Niyaji have thought that then that USA would rescue them uh, from this situation. But uh, something like that did not happen. So uh, what do you think that what was the US assessment of the 1971 situation? And uh, why did the US not intervene directly in favor of Pakistan? You see, uh, 1971 came at a very bad time for the US. You see, that everything was going very well for the United States. They have just made up with uh, China. Uh, China. There was a sense of Danta still existing with, with the Soviet Union. They were uh, 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 dialing down on Vietnam. Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, everything was going right for them. And then this happened, you see. Uh, U.S. itself would have no problem with uh, with the uh, uh, Sheikh Mujib, you see, uh, uh, because it was Sarwardi, by the way, who was uh, Sheikh Mujib's mentor. Um, mentor. And, uh, mm. uh, this thing, who uh, took Pakistan to uh, on a pro pro West line. I mean, Pakistan signed all the CETO, CENTO, Baghdad Pact agreements. Uh, said of the non-alignment that zero plus zero equal to zero. You see, and became pro pro West. You see. So uh, the America would not be uh, this thing to a, a, a sort of unsupportive of an Awami League-led government. Uh, and OK, in any case, Awami League was a centrist party. Awami League was not a NAP, which is the left party. It was not the Communist Party of Bangladesh. And those activities, I mean, they were very wary of these communist kind of activities mm -hmm. in Southeast Asia, Vietnam, etc. So it would have been all right. But the problem was. Uh, was the problem with India, you see? Mm -hmm. Now they saw that, okay, I mean, they would have to take sides. Now, uh, they were, as I said, very beholden to Pakistan for the role that Pakistan was playing in the links with China, okay? So Nixon had this, uh, uh, quite rightly for him, that he needed Pakistan's support. And he thought, I mean, uh, he, he, he did not want to upset Yahya. You see, because Yaya was playing, a, and, and his diplomatic team were playing a very positive role for the, for the United States. So he, uh, and okay, there is also another, uh, uh, I don't know how substantive that is, that there wasn't, uh, they, uh, he didn't particularly gel with Mrs. Gandhi in terms of personal relationship. Mm -hmm. You see, uh, that is said, but I, I do not know how far it is actually true. But later on, uh, we hear of remarks that he had made because when they became public, maybe it's true that he didn't particularly uh, 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 like Mrs. Gandhi. Though Kissinger himself, to my mind, uh, had a more a practical uh, view. I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, he, he thought uh, Mrs. Gandhi was uh, far more practical than that. I mean, you know, she would not uh, just go into the Soviet camp for nothing, you see, that she would also wait. But, uh, but from what we know now, that uh, in, from his White, uh, White House years and other books written on the end of time, that Kissinger was under very sharp uh, direction from, from Nixon to support Pakistan, and th which is now, uh, which is famously called the tilt towards Pakistan. When his advisors asked him what the tilt, uh, I mean, uh, is it a pragmatic or practical thing, the tilt? Uh, he said that it doesn't matter. Uh, it's what the president wants. He doesn't want to, to be, in his words, even-handed. He wants to support Pakistan. Okay. So, all right. Uh, uh, so, the government did. But in America, uh, as you know, America is, is not just the government. 
primarily. Uh, so yeah. there are many elements in, in the other American system, also in the system of governance, who were very sympathetic to the liberation movement. I mean, people like Senators uh, Edward Kennedy, uh, Fred Harris, William Saxby, uh, all these people, uh, then followed by 10 other senators, you see, they wrote letters to William Rogers, who was Secretary of State, to recognize as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. and also uh, later, but also support the, uh, the aspirations of, of, of the Bengalis. Edward Kennedy, for instance, played a very, very significant And uh, role. Kennedy also visited Bangladesh at that time. Yes. Yes, okay. uh, Kennedy visited the camps, as far as I recall, the refugee camps, mm -hmm. but he visited Bangladesh before, before American recognition. recognition. He visited Bangladesh before American recognition. The media, for instance, even American diplomats, you would have heard of this book called uh, the Blood Telegram, but even before the book, I mean, we knew of uh, Archer Blood, who was a consul general in Dhaka, and he was sending uh, telegrams or messages to to Dhaka saying that Yahya is just, you know, uh, crossed the Rubicon, so to say, with regard to, uh, to the Bangladesh crisis. So, so there was a, a groundswell of support from within the American community. And uh, I, I think, sir, also uh, there were some concerts, musical concerts for raising uh, funds uh, for Bangladesh. Like, oh, yes, like yes, of course. Yeah, I mean, in, yes. Apart, apart from this, on the, on the political spectrum, on the social side, yes, the media, musical concerts, the Beatles, for instance. Of course, the Beatles are British, but it doesn't matter. The audience that you said, I mean, huh. this was in New York, and I spent many years in New York. Uh, uh, the Beatles concert uh, is still remembered, still, still remembered. And, uh, you know, uh, the Beatles themselves have always spoken of it even years later. Years later, John Lennon and others. John Lennon. But so, so that kind of thing moderated the, the tilt. Eventually, though, on the 14th of, I mean, you know, uh, sort of, first of all, to sort of underscore uh, the support to Pakistan because they didn't want uh, 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 that to be nothing, you see. At the same time, by then, Pakistan also realized that the, the game was over, you see. Because as the, as the war was progressing, as you know, that's another story. I mean, the whole Pakistani strategy was to move back to, to Dhaka and then to surrender directly to the Indians, yeah. you see? Yes, so, okay. So that was already happening uh, as soon as the war began. I mean, in a few days that began. And you see, within the Indian strate uh, strategic uh, community, there was also the debate as to whether you capture territory and move towards Dhaka or go straight to Dhaka. Uh, you know, but that was an internal Indian with Manik Shaw and his generals. Then uh, the Americans declared that they are going to send a detachment of uh, uh, a, a task force detached from the Seventh Fleet with the with, with the uh, uh, with the Enterprise. You know, the uh, uh, flat boat uh, Enterprise into the Bay of Bengal, and on the fourteenth of December. Malacca Straits, I, I'm in Singapore, uh, Malacca, very close to where I'm sitting right now, it crossed the, uh, uh, the Malacca Straits. Three days later, however, six Russian ships also crossed the Malacca Straits. But 14th of, uh, uh, crossed the Malacca Straits to go to the Bay of Bengal, which they would, the environs of the Bay of Bengal, they probably reached around the 15th of December, a tad too late to do anything, you see, because by that time, uh, things were moving very rapidly, and it, it, the war was conducted at a, at a lightning speed, actually, because uh, 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 right from the start, the Pakistanis took no chance. No, Whereas when we began our conversation, you spoke of the Western Front. Western Front would have been a different story, but, you know, uh, neither side wanted to go into that. One just last question. Uh, coming back to the present scenario, so what are the elements uh, that drive contemporary Bangladesh-India relationship uh, then and now, maybe? Well, okay. I mean, in many ways, it's a bit akin to what I had said about the Bengaliness and the Musliminess of, of the Bangladeshis, you see. But there are certain elements. I mean, uh, South Asia, to my mind, uh, and I'm a, I like to believe that I'm a student of international politics and uh, I, I study international politics, uh, uh, try to study 
quite deeply, of course, I was a diplomat, also functionary. South Asia is a system. Whatever you say, I mean, whether SARC exists or not, South Asia is a system, what we call it international. There are things that happen in, in this region that tie one to the other to make it a broad uh, system in, in international relations. Now, here, a very great dichotomy, I will not call it a divide, is between these two communities of Hindus and Muslims, you see? That we have to address. And now, Bangladesh is by and large, uh, uh, is, a, uh, is, is a fairly, um, um, what shall we say, um, I mean, uh, secular, by, in religious terms, community, you see? Um, now, of course, uh, there have been these uh, cases that once we spoke about, uh, you and I, I mean, this, this is a, uh, but the fact that, uh, uh, that many of, many Bangladeshis came out in the street to protest what happened in Kumila recently, for instance, the riots and all that sort of thing, is a, uh, is a, a sign of the fact that Bangladesh has remained to this day a secular system. You see, uh, the middle classes, the the uh, people down the line, uh, the the uh, the Still economic the entrepreneurs, uh, the army, the civil service, and all that. You see, it's really concerned with development now. I mean, that's what I see. Uh, 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 being a diplomat, I physically lived away from the country for a long time, and I've been a, 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 a sort of a, 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 a scholar in, in Singapore. So uh, now, so that, what happens in India is also very relevant to this relationship. Now, this is where the big challenge comes that, uh, you know, Sometimes the sort of the current initiatives that we see in India, like the CAA and all that, can have the potentials to have a have a negative impact on these developments. You see, I mean, these may lead to short time uh, short term electoral benefits, but it'll come at a huge cost. Which is why I think that Sheikh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's flagging with the Indian leadership that, uh, and I paraphrase her, that not to act in a way that could create cross-border reactions in a simple one and yet realistic and is, is a simple one, but it's very profound and it should be heeded. I do not, uh, I, I, I'm a great optimist, you see, and uh, everything I have said, I've tried to be uh, uh, sort of rational. For example, you are interviewing me. What difference is there? For, I, I treat you like I would treat any young Bangladeshi, a student of mine here yeah, in Bangladesh, I make no difference. Uh, few of us would. It is possible. Uh, it is po and remember, Bangladesh also uh, has tried in the past. I mean, it, it, uh, it's not as powerful uh, as, uh, as India, of course, but to bring together the South Asian countries uh, through, uh, through sort of associations such as SARC and all that sort of thing, it's because, uh, and we have also found out that, uh, that peace, stability leads to benefits. It's true uh, what I'm saying that you see, Bangladesh's economic business have been tremendous, frankly. I mean, sometimes it, it goes unsung, but many ideas have also come from, from Bengal. I mean, it's not just because of what Bengal thinks today, here think tomorrow. <laughs> but it, it, many ideas, you know, the, the social ideas, ideas of, on education, women's empowerment, and not just social indices, even economic indices like development, growth. Uh, as they say that, you know, uh, uh, as an economist, if uh, data fails you, just observe with your eyes. Today's Bangladesh is very different from Bangladesh uh, or when it was born. Very, very different. You see, those days it was minus 14 GDP. Today it has sustained growth rate for decades at 6%. So, but we want to be, uh, uh, I don't think that the people of Bangladesh or the government, of course, uh, doesn't want, uh, want to get into a conflict situation with any country. Uh, if we uh, could get into a conflict situation, a country, the first candidate would be in Myanmar. You see? Yeah. So, uh, the potential, but India is the elder brother. And in, 
obviously. I mean, uh, sort of, uh, so, uh, I mean, they make this difference between the bigger brother and their elder brother, you see. So they say that, so in many ways, uh, the path has to be, uh, has to be uh, smoothened by, by India. I mean, in fact, there is no such thing as a path. A path is made by, by walking, you see. Uh, we also uh, have to take into consideration that when we deal with India, we deal with many factors. We deal with New Delhi for landscape, you see. We deal with uh, you and Calcutta. We deal with Shillong. We deal with Tripura. Uh, everything is important for us, yes. you see. So for us, it's, it, it's a hugely complex challenge dealing with India. But the fact that people of Bangladesh have a, a fund of goodwill for people of India is absolutely evident by the kind of interactions that you and I are having. And I know that many of my friends, colleagues, and et cetera, of the, we will celebrate with, uh, with the Indians very soon uh, the, this anniversary. And uh, as I said at the beginning of my remarks that we are truly grateful but it uh, depends on, on the current leaderships in both country to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to take us the right path reflecting the popular will. It's a challenge, but, uh, uh, but you know, when you succeed in challenges, that is when you go and rise. Okay. So, so the discussion, uh, it's really fascinating for me. I don't... I, I really believe that it is same for the viewers too. So, so maybe. Uh, well, I I wish okay. I mean, this is another uh, autopia. I mean, I, I I've been a great student of actually also with all these things. Like, like for example, uh, uh, in my university, we had people like Deepesh Chakraborty and uh, you know the the sort of uh, Ranjit Guha and all that sort of the subalterns uh, of Indian Still, history hmm. and in yeah. Even in, in study and research, you see, everybody who's in social science, this part of the world knows a bone day, I mean, you know. So, so it's a fascinating relationship, I think, uh, but uh, we have to, uh, we're not the only ones who make the relationship. We have to bring our peoples along with us, you see, and, sure. and people like you and your counterparts in my country, you see, young artists, think who are our future? And uh, the kind of experiences that I spoke to you is from my own experience, largely. So, so you will have a different set of experiences. Your counterparts in Bangladesh will have a different experiences. You're not the same generation as me. So I have kind of things mm -hmm. that I have witnessed and spoken to you about. You see, my younger ones, uh, my children and you all will have a different set of experiences. So we have to make you understand each other more. And that's our, our job. Yeah. Thank you, Arko Priya. It was lovely talking to you. Absolutely. So, uh, thank you so much, sir, for your valuable time and words on this controversial issue. Uh, we really hope that our readers and listeners will have newer perspective on this topic. So, uh, thank you so much, sir, once again. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, another thing, I haven't spoken to your uh, sort of um, viewers directly, but I want to tell them, you see, uh, that uh, we have nothing but goodwill uh, for for all uh, Bengalis in India and the Indians in general, and look to a stronger relationship when we have the, uh, after this an anniversary as well. And whatever I have said of history, remember that all history is is is, is perceptions. You see, uh, but you know sometimes uh, because we have spoken of. Uh, of certain events which have not gone into uh, into record, you see. So, so uh, uh, th then then there are some exposures to because I've had the benefit of some direct exposures. I said to you that I've spoken directly to Mrs. Gandhi. I've spoken to people like uh, Mr. Haksar, uh, you know, who had a very major role in 1971, and all all those American and Chinese leaders we've spoken of. I mean. I've myself had interactions with them, you see, uh, uh, in my own career, through my own career, the Chinese, the Americans, the Russians who we spoke about, and I spent many years in the United Nations. So, so uh, but, uh, but putting on, on the matrix of, of, uh, of global relations, I think India and Bangladesh 
are a very good example of what positive relation, what uh, relationships can, uh, can achieve in terms of positivities. You see, um, so this is another thing that I hope that we remain an example to the rest of the world. Yeah, sure, sir. I I hope that we again talk in future sometimes regarding. Yes, of course. Too. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. I I, I think interactions like this. Uh, do a tremendously positive thing in terms of relationships as well. I mean, I don't want to over-exaggerate this, but but it's true. Thank you, all, Priya. Thank you, And sir. thanks to everyone at uh, yeah, Third Lane. And give them my very fond regards. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. Thank you, sir.